Improve your English listening. Mika. The pain in her eyes nearly kills me. If it were possible, I'd go back in time and stop her from climbing down that tree that god-awful night. Maybe then, I'd still have my best friend. I decide to make a sporadic stop to try and get Ella out of her own head. I park the car in an open space in front of the small coffee house located in the heart of town, between the stop end shop and Bubba's sports barn. I shut off the engine and wait patiently for her to scold me. Her face reddens as she takes in where we are. Mika, I'm really not in the mood for this right now. I have things to do and so does Lila. Come on, you haven't seen me play in ages, I coax, using my best seductive voice. I'll just do one song. In and out and we're done. Sounds cool to me, Lila says from the back seat, finally relaxing a little now that we're far away from Grady's trailer. I love hearing bands and lead singers are always sexy. Mika plays the guitar and sings by himself, Ella says with a flicker of possessiveness in her eyes. He's not a lead singer. He's a solo singer. It's all the same to me. Lila pats Ella's head and in a way I think she's making a private joke with her. Band or not, a guy who can sing and play is hot. I grin charismatically and incline over the console. Come on, pretty girl. I wind a strand of her hair around my finger. You know you want to come in and watch me be all hot and sexy, singing up on the stage. You know you've missed it. Her eyes narrow at me as she fights back a smile. You know that voice doesn't work on me. I've seen you use it too many times on too many girls. I haven't used it on a girl since you left. I let the truth fall out. I used to come and go as I please with whoever I wanted, but once things started to change with our friendship, it became clear the void I was trying to fill was in her. And I don't want to use it on anyone. She conceals her hand over my mouth. I'll go in with you, but only if you stop talking about stuff that makes me uncomfortable. Wait. What about my car? Lila scoots forward and fixes her hair using the rearview mirror. It's getting late. Won't the shop be closed soon? I move Ella's hand away from my lips and entwine her fingers with mine. We'll make it back in time. I promise. Ella hesitates, staring at the coffee house like she's a mouse about to walk into a lion's den. I squeeze her hand. Come on, let's go in. You'll be okay. She looks at our hands, and then her gaze lifts, giving a fleeting glance at my lips before resolving on my eyes. Is everyone still hanging out here? Kelly and Mike do and Renee and Ethan, I say. Grant Ford doesn't really come around here anymore, though. Her plump lips curl to a grin. Because you punched him in the face. That might be part of it. I return her smile and let go of her hand to climb out of the car. It feels like I might be getting somewhere with her. She hops out and stretches, arching her back and sticking out her chest. 
It makes me want to rip off her shirt, pull her in the back seat, and do things to her I've never done with anyone I've cared about before. What are you looking at? She pulls the bottom of her tank top back over her stomach. She really has no idea how beautiful she is. She never has. Even back in her punk goth phase, she rocked the look. I shake my head, unable to take my eyes off her. Nothing. Just thinking dot. She slams the door and we head across the packed parking lot. I rest my hand on her lower back, but she wiggles away and sidesteps around Lila, putting her between us. I frown. Maybe I'm not doing as well as I thought. Ella. If he keeps looking at me that way, my restraint is going to melt into a puddle of hot steamy liquid. Mika has the most piercing eyes in the world, aqua blue, like the sea, waved with equal intensity. He's flirty with me, which he used to do jokingly all the time, and I'd play along. But this is different somehow, more intense and real. It's like his throwing his heart into the open, which isn't how he used to be. At least with me. Except for the day I left. The coffee house is cramped with people, even for a Saturday afternoon. Every booth and table is occupied and there's a guy with floppy brown hair playing the keyboard on stage, his voice a little off-key. The baristas are working hard on the long line that extends all the way to the door and in the corner, people are working on their laptops. Where are we going to sit? Lila scans the room. There's no empty tables. Mika spots Ethan and Renee at a corner table and waves at them. Seat situation solved, he says taking my hand and leading the way to them. Renee is a short girl that wears heavy eyeliner and has dark red hair. Her hazel eyes sewn in on Mika's hand tangled with mine. I attempt to pull my hand away, but Mika strengthens his grasp. Hey, Ella. She fakes a smile with her dark red lips. What why I been up to? Nothing much, I keep it simple, because simple is always better with Renee. And so we meet again. Ethan flashes a dimpled grin at Lila and pulls out a chair for her. You decided to stick around here for a while. Lila looks up at him as she takes a seat. Thank you. I kind of had to since my car was trashed last night. Mika drops down in the last empty chair at the table and starts to pull me down to sit on his lap. My eyes sweep the room in search of an extra chair, but it's so packed that people have to stand near the walls. I don't bite, Ella May. There is a challenge in Mika's eyes. Unless you ask me to. Everyone at the table is watching me. Not wanting to make a scene, I sink down on his lap. Ethan targets Mika with a bewildered look, which Mika ignores and steals a scone out of a basket in the middle of the table. He pops it into his mouth. So what times open am I see? Ethan's dark eyebrows plunge together. Why? Are you thinking about playing again? Cause all I can say is it's about freaking time. What do you mean again? I ask, grabbing a scone myself. Why hasn't he been playing? E 
Ethan shoves up the sleeves of his shirt, crosses his arms on the table, and directs Mika with their secret code look I have never been able to crack. I revolve my body to look at Mika, but instantly regret it. His eyes are too intense and I'm thrown out of my element for a second. You stopped playing? I ask him. Why would you do that? Isn't it your dream still? He shrugs, snaking his arms around my waist. It's not the same without you here watching me. There were times I didn't watch you play. I put my hands on his shoulders. Even when I lived here. He shakes his head and wisps of his blonde hair fall across his forehead. That's not true. You never missed one. I think back, knowing his right. I don't want you to stop living your life because I'm not here anymore. And I don't want you to be anywhere but here. He squeezes my hip and I instinctively jump at the tingling heat that spirals down between my legs. What can I get you? The waitress interrupts us. We all read off what we want, and the waitress gets particularly giggly when she writes down Mika's order, even though I'm sitting on his lap. Her name is Kenzie and I've never liked her. She used to help Stacy Harris torment this girl we went to school with, who was in a wheelchair. I casually lean back against Mika's chest, as if I'm doing it by accident. No one seems to notice except for the waitress. And Mika. His heartbeat speeds up as if the nearness of my body is driving him mad. She frowns and tucks the order book into her apron. I'll be right back with your drinks. I wait for Mika to call me out, but he stays quiet and keeps his hands on the tops of my bare thighs. I know it's wrong and that is not mine. I made that clear the day I bailed, but I can't seem to help myself. Ever since we were kids, I always felt the need to keep him away from girls who aren't good enough for him. Old habits die hard. Mika. Ethan is looking at me like I'm an idiot. Probably because I'm smiling like an idiot, but I can't help myself. Ella got territorial with the waitress. She's never done that before, not even before she left. This band's interesting, Lila hollers over the banjo band playing up on stage. Is this the kind of music you play? Ethan, Renee, and I burst out laughing. Even Ella covers her mouth trying really hard not to laugh. No, sweetie, this isn't what I play. I gulp my coffee. Mine's more. Hot and sexy, Ella says and I stare at her. She ignores my gaze and adds, think more along the lines of spill canvas. Lila brushes some crumbs off the table. That band you're always listening to when you're studying? Ella nods, but shifts awkwardly. That's the one. It makes me feel better that she still listens to the same music. At least that hasn't changed. I keep one hand on her leg, afraid if I release her completely, she'll run off again. I steal another scone from the basket and pop it into my mouth. Lila starts chatting with Ethan and Renee gets on her cell phone. I sweep Ella's hair to the side and put my lips to her ear. So you think I'm hot and sexy, huh? She bites back a smile, 
pretending to be deeply immersed in the banjo song. No, I said your music is hot and sexy. It's all the same. I dare a kiss against her shoulder, relishing the softness of her skin, wanting her so goddamn bad I'm getting a hard on just thinking about it. Ella notices it too and squirms around in my lap, making it worse. Down boy, she jokes with a nervous laugh, then presses her lips together and starts to stand up. I trap her down by the hips and conform her backside onto my lap. We fit together so perfectly it's mind-blowing and all those feelings I felt for her before she left come rushing back to me. I need more of her. Now. Oblivious to everyone around us, my hands gradually slide up her thighs. Mika. She protests with a quiver in her voice. Don't. There are people. I silence her as my fingers brush the edges of her skirt. I can't stop, I've been carrying this sexual tension for ages. I started having these feelings for her when we were about 16. I ignored them for as long as possible, because I knew she'd freak if she found out. There were a few stolen kisses that I played off, but the night on the bridge, when I finally put it out there, changed everything. She freaked out just like I thought. Right after she left, I slept around, trying to get rid of the hunger inside of me, but after a while, I realized there was no point. Ella had taken something from me and there was no getting it back, unless I had her. So I let my hand sneak up the edge of her skirt and her fingers knead into my thighs. I wonder how far I should take this, since we're sitting in a booth in a crowded room, and I almost pull back, but one of her legs falls to the side, and I view it as an open invitation. Alright, it's time for open MIC. The waitress that undressed me with her eyes speaks into the microphone on the stage. If you already haven't signed up, you can sign up with Phil over there. She points her finger at the owner, a middle-aged man sitting in the corner next to the speakers. I think that's your cue. Ella quickly gets up, thinking she's off the hook. Before I head up to the sign-up sheet, I spread my fingers across her lower back and whisper in her ear. Don't think this is over because it's not. She shivers and I strut off to the table with a satisfied smile on my face. Well, son of a bitch, Phil says from behind the table. He's an ex-band member of an 80s cover band and still looks like he belongs in that decade with his mullet and neon clothes. Look what the dog dragged in. Miss me that bad, huh? I jot down my name on the sign-up sheet. Are you kidding me? He asks. All we've had to listen to for the last few months is banjo music and a couple of hippies playing on the bongos. I swear it's like Woodstock all over again. I laugh, dropping the pen onto the table. Well, it's nice to know I've been missed, I guess. Phil fiddles with the volume of the amps. More than missed. Please tell me you're going to start playing here again. I'm in desperate need of some drawing. This place is going downhill. I smile politely, backing toward the table. Nah. Probably not. I don't think I'm going to be sticking around here much longer. I've got places to go, people to see. 
On my way back to the table, I cross paths with Naomi. She is Phil's daughter, tall, with long black hair, and she's an awesome singer. I used to play with her back before she went on the road with a band. We were actually pretty close, but I haven't talked to her since she left. Oh my god, I'm so glad I ran into you, she says and there's a little bit of red lipstick on her teeth. Isn't everyone? I tease walking backwards. She laughs and swats my arm. I see you still have that whole cocky attitude going. I drop the act. So you're back in town? Yeah, but only for a few weeks. Can we chat up after you play? There's something I really need to talk to you about. Something huge actually. How do you know I was playing? She points a finger at the table. I just saw you sign up. All right, I'll catch up with you later. I wave goodbye, wondering what she could possibly want. Ella. Damn Mika. He's killing me with his touches and longing gazes and now he's going to sing. I've always had a soft spot for his voice. We'd sit on his bed and he'd strum his guitar while I sketched. Those were some of the perfect moments in my life. Ella, what's the matter with you? Lila asks with an accusation. You look a little flushed. I sip my latte and realign the holder in the center of the table, so I can't see my reflection in the stainless steel. It's just a little hot in here. That's all. Yeah, sure it is. She won't stop looking at me, like she's trying to crack open my head. As Mika steps onto the stage not too far from our table, my heart starts to chant unspeakable words. Sitting on a stool with his guitar on his lap he puts his lips up to the microphone, nibbling on his lip ring. This one's called What No One Ever Sees. He strums a chord with his eyes locked on me. I see it in your beautiful eyes, like a spot on the sun. The things you want to hide, buried deep inside you. Blinded by your light. It almost hurts to look at, almost hurts to breathe. Never can you look at the things no one ever sees. Shaded by your light. Please take me inside you, please take me in. Never will I whisper, never will I give in. Even when I'm dying, your heart will always win. Shielded to the sightless, isolated from the naive. Breaking you in pieces, that can only ever grieve. Veiled by your light. Passionate for the world, yet overlooked by most. Your soul flickers in you, desperate to shine for the world. But blinded by your darkness. Please take me inside you, please take me in. Never will I whisper, never will I give in. Even when I'm dying, your heart will always win. With one lasting note, he ends the song. The crowd applauds and my eyes dart away from his penetrating gaze, and to the door. I want to run away like the room is on fire. Holy crap, Lila breathes, fanning herself. You were right. That was hot. I can play the drums. 
Ethan taps his fingers on the table and makes drum noises. And I'm pretty good. Don't let him fool YA. Renee sips her coffee and a smirk curls at her lips. He can play the drums on rock band and that's it. Ethan shoots Renee a dirty look. Would you quit it? It's not funny anymore. Lila looks at me for an explanation. This is how they are, I explain with a heavy sigh. They fight like cats and dogs. Lila props her elbows onto the table and rests her chin on her hands. L, doesn't your brother play drums? Yeah, Dean did, I say. A little bit, anyway. Now Dean's hot, Renee remarks, aiming to get under my skin. Mika collects his guitar and clears the stage for the next singer, a girl with pink dreads who looks like she has a grudge against the world. A tall girl with long legs meets Mika at the corner of the stage. Her wavy black hair flows down her back, her grey eyes are striking, and her smile is bright. Her name is Naomi and she's the daughter of the owner of the coffee house who Mika played with a few times. She says something to Mika and he laughs. A flicker of envy burns in me, but I suppress it quickly. She leads him off the stage and Mika's hand roams toward her back. He flashes me one last glance, before he ducks behind stage. I can't read him at all and that frightens me more than when I can. Lila drinks her soy latte and peeks at me over the brim of her cup. I don't care what you say. That boy is in love with you. I stay silent, tearing up a napkin until it's shaped like a heart. He might be, but not the kind of love you're talking about. So, Ella, Ethan interrupts and I swear he does it intentionally. If he did, I'm thankful for it. How's the city life? Stupendous. I ruffle up the napkin and toss it into the empty scone basket. That doesn't sound very convincing. Ethan drapes an arm on the back of Lila's chair and places his foot on his knee. Don't you like it there? I force myself to cheer up and sit up straight. Actually, it's pretty nice. There's a lot to do and the school is great. You're acting weird. Ethan eyes me, rubbing his chin. Something's got you all wound up. I'm completely okay, I say in denial. Although, the excessive questions are a bit much. Lila peers over at me as she licks froth from her lips. He's right. You look upset or something. She feels my forehead. You're not getting sick. Are you? Mika returns to the table and the coffee house has cleared out a bit. He grabs a vacant chair, pulls it up to the table, turning it backwards, and then sits down in it. So what are we up to for the rest of the night? Ethan asks while Mika checks his messages on his phone. I got to take this pretty lady over here to get her car fixed by you. Mika nods his head at Lila. Ethan looks pleased. Wow, I'm honored to be the one to fix it. Mika slides his phone into his pocket. We have to swing by Ella's house and pick it up, so meet us at the shop in like a half an hour. Absolutely. 
Ethan waves the waitress over to give us the check. What do you think? Mika asks me. Does it sound like a plan? I shrug, distracted by where he went with that girl. Yeah, sure. Everyone takes their coffees to go and we head for the door. I leave mine behind, along with something else, but I'm not sure what. Perhaps a piece of my new identity. Mika and I don't speak the entire drive home. It freaks Lila out a little and I worry that the more time she spends here with me, the less time she's going to want to spend with me on campus. When we pull into the driveway that roots the side of my house, there is a painful reminder of another reason I didn't want to come back waiting for me near the garage. Whose car is that? Lila scoots forward in her seat. It's gorgeous. Why is he here? I grimace, scowling at the shiny red Porsche with Ohio license plates. Now be nice, Mika warns, his voice dripping with sarcasm. He's your brother. But it doesn't make him less of an asshole, I mutter. And he swore when he left, he was never coming back here ever again. That's your brother's car? Lila asks. Good God, what does he do for living? I press the tips of my fingers to the sides of my nose. Who knows? Well, how does he afford a car like that? She requests interestedly. It's not his car, I say. It's my mother's. Mika and I swap an oblique look, recalling the day the car mysteriously showed up in the garage. She never would tell anyone how she got it, and for a while, Dean and I expected the police to show up and arrest her for car thievery. It never happened and as time went on, it became like a game to my mother. Not just with the car, but with life. We never knew if she was telling the truth or not. After she died, Dean took the car. He acted like it was his right and maybe it was. He wasn't the one who'd snuck out of the house that night and left our mother alone. That gorgeous car over there is yours, I remind Lila, diverting her attention elsewhere. You should probably go get it fixed, before Ethan wanders off from the shop. She slumps back in the chair. I'd really like to meet your brother first before I go. I'm sure he'll still be here when you get back. Actually I'm hoping he'll be gone. Come on, Lila, we'll make it quick. Mika opens the door. We can drop it off and walk back. It isn't too far. When I climb outside, he captures my gaze over the roof of the car. Are you coming with us? I think I need to stay. My eyes travel to the back door. Who knows why he's here and what he'll say to dad. And I don't think dad can handle his crap. Pressing his hands to the roof, he leans over. But can you handle his crap? I'll be fine, I assure him. Just get her car fixed. She needs to get out before she gets sucked into this place. This town isn't that bad. Mika closes the door. You used to think the same thing. I also used to believe my mom would get better, I say. And look what a crushing disappointment that was. 
From the back of the car, Lila blinks at me, stunned. Ella, I didn't know your mom was sick. Mika's expression is guarded. Let's go, Lila. Ella's right, if Ethan gets too bored, he'll bail. They head for Lila's car and I head up the driveway, wishing I could run back into Mika's arms and alleviate the hole in my chest. Mika I worry about Ella the entire drive to the shop. Dean was never a good brother and at the funeral, he blamed Ella for their mother's death. He basically tore her to shreds. Maybe it was his way of mourning, but it was still a shitty thing to do. So what's up with Ella and her brother? Lila asks, resting her arm on the console. I think that's something you should probably talk to her about. I turn the car into the parking lot of the shop. It's not really my story to tell. Lila unclips her seatbelt. But Ella's never really told me much about her life. She has always been so quiet about it and I just thought it was her personality. But the way everyone talks about her around here, I don't think it is. She used to be pretty loud-spoken. I reach for the door, but hesitate, needing to get it off my chest. The Ella I knew was not the prim and proper girl you've been hanging out with. She had this fire in her and she didn't put up with anyone's crap. It got her into trouble a lot, but she was also the kind of person who would take the fall, even if it wasn't her fault. I think I saw that part of her when we stopped at a bathroom when we first got to town, Lila muses. There was this guy there who was giving me crap and Ella nearly beat him up. I try not to smile. She did, did she? Is that how she was when you knew her? Like a total badass. Lila grins and I realize she's not as bad as I originally thought. Yeah, she was always kind of a badass. I shove the door open and my boots scuff the gravel as I climb out. There are a few cars parked in front of the metal building and both the garage doors are open. A truck is parked inside and the owner of the shop Ethan's dad is working under the hood. So what do you do? Lila asks as we head to the entrance. A little of this, I joke. And a little of that. So it's a secret. She picks up on my vibe. I swing the chain attached to my jeans. For now, it kind of is. Gotcha. She doesn't press and I like her even more. Ethan is waiting for us in the lobby, slouched back in a chair with his shoes kicked up on the counter and his head slanted back. It's about damn time. I was about ready to leave. Lila starts to giggle as she takes out her phone from her purse. You guys weren't lying. Ethan lowers his feet to the floor and stands up. What's so funny? Nothing. I shrug him off, resting my arms on the counter. Ella and I just told her that if we didn't hurry up you'd get bored and leave. So you were talking about me behind my back. He walks around the counter by Lila. You got the keys or did you leave them in? I toss him the keys and he catches them. Where's Ella? Her brother showed up, I explain. She's back at her house. 
Ethan's eyebrows shoot upward. And you left her there alone with him. Only to drop this off, I say. Lila and I are going to walk back. Lila glances back and forth between Ethan and me. Is something wrong with Ella's brother? She'll be fine. I lean against the glass door with my arms folded and check my watch. But we should get back. I think I should stay here, Lila says, frowning at her phone. Are you sure? I ask. Ethan will take good care of it. She looks upset as she tosses the phone into her purse. Yeah, I need to make sure everything's taken care of properly. Alright, can you find your way back to the house? I nudge the door open. I'll make sure she gets there, Ethan offers with a shrug. Lila adjusts her purse on her shoulder and gives him a small smile. Thank you. All right, if it's okay with the both of you, then I guess I'll see you later. I hike across the parking lot, toward the street. It's getting late, and the odds of Lila's car being fixed by the end of the day are pretty fucking low. I take out my cell phone and text Ella. Me. Just wanting to make sure you're okay. I walk down the sidewalk fenced by houses and dried out lawns. There is a drug exchange going on at the corner between a group of kids that still look young enough to be in high school. This side of town is pretty crappy, which I'm okay with now, but when Ella and I were kids, it was harder to deal with. Ella was always so curious about stuff. There were many times we got chased down for sticking our noses where they didn't belong and I got my ass kicked defending Ella quite a few times. But I'd do it again in a heartbeat because when it all comes down to it, it's just me and her against the world. Always has been. My phone buzzes inside my pocket and I check the message, surprised to see Ella's name on the screen. Ella, no, I don't think I am. Without a second thought, I run as fast as I can toward her house. Ella. Dean's got his music blasting upstairs at full volume and it's rattling the ceiling. I start picking up the garbage in the kitchen, avoiding the confrontation of seeing him again. Propping the trash can against my hip, I drag my arm along the counter, pushing a line of bottles into it. I pull out the bag and tie the string shut, holding it far away from me. God, that stinks. Still cleaning up after Dad, I see. Dean enters the kitchen. He's dressed in slacks and a button-down shirt, the sleeves rolled up to his elbows. His dark brown hair is cut short and it shows off the scar on the top of his forehead, where I accidentally hit him during a freak accident while we were playing baseball with a tent pole and a basketball. Nothing changes around here, even when you leave for a year. He opens the fridge and steals a beer. Although, you do look different. Did you finally clean up your act? Do you really care if I did? I drag the garbage bag toward the back door. I think you made it perfectly clear the last time you were here that you don't give a shit what happens to me. He pops the cap off the bottle. Are you still on that? You told me I killed our mother, I say quietly. How could I be over that? 
He sips his beer and shrugs. I thought you left so you could move on with your life. I summon a deep breath. I didn't move on. I bailed just like you did. I ran away for the same reason you run away because staying here means dealing with the past and our pasts are the kind that need to be locked away and never revisited. You mean dealing with mom's death. And the fact that it was my fault she's dead. Or that I'm responsible for her death. He peels at the beer bottle label. Why do you always have to be so blunt about everything? It makes people uncomfortable. I'm changing back into my old ways and I need to collect myself. Opening the back door, I toss the garbage bag onto the back steps. Do you want to go get some dinner or something? We could go out to Alpine where no one really knows us. He shakes his head, gulps down the rest of the beer, and then tosses the empty bottle into the trash. The only reason I came back here was to get the rest of my stuff. Then I'm out. I got stuff to go back to that's more important than family drama and alcoholic fathers. He leaves me in the kitchen and a few seconds later, the music is turned up louder. It's an upbeat rhythm and it drives me crazy, so I crank on the kitchen radio, blasting shameful metaphors by Chevelle. I start sweeping up the kitchen, blocking out my brother's words. He always liked to nitpick me apart, which was fine, but at the funeral, he crossed a line we can never come back from. The back door swings open and the wind rushes in as my dad stumbles into the kitchen. His shoes are untied, his jeans are torn, and his red shirt is stained with dirt and grease. His hand is wrapped with an old rag that's soaked in blood. Dropping the broom to the floor, I rush to him. Oh my god, are you okay? He flinches from me and nods his head, staggering to the sink. Just cut myself on the job. No biggie. I turn down the music. Dad, you weren't drinking at work, were you? He turns the faucet on and his head slumps over. The guys and I had a couple of shots during lunch break, but I'm not drunk. He removes the rag and sticks his hand under the water, letting out a relieved sigh as the water mixes with his blood. Is your brother home? I thought I saw his car in the driveway. I grab a paper towel and clean up the blood he got on the counter and on the floor. He's upstairs packing up some stuff or something. He dabs his hand with a paper towel, wincing. Well, that's good I guess. I lean over to examine his hand. Do I need to take you to the doctor? That looks like it might need stitches. I'll be fine. He grabs a bottle of vodka takes a swig, and then douses his hand with it. Dad, what are you doing? I reach for the first aid kit above the sink. Use the rubbing alcohol from the first aid kit. Breathing through clenched teeth, he wraps up his hand with a paper towel. See, good as new. It can still get infected. I take out the kit and set it on the counter. You should really let me take you to a doctor. He stares at me for a moment with his eyes full of agony. God, you look so much like her, it's just crazy. 
He drags his feet as he walks out the doorway and into the living room. Seconds later, I hear the television click on and the air fills with smoke. Suppressed feelings surface as I put the first aid kit back into the cupboard. Cranking up the music, I drowning out my pain and busy myself with the dishes. My phone vibrates in my pocket and I wipe my hands off on a towel before checking my messages. There's the voicemail from Mika from yesterday that I still haven't listened to and a new text message from him. The text message seems like the less dangerous of the two. My hand trembles as I read it over and over again, then finally respond. I toss the phone on the counter and focus on cleaning because it's simple. And simple is just what I want. Mika. I barge into Ella's house. Something bad happened, probably because of her douchebag brother. Ella is scrubbing down the counters with the same amount of energy as a drummer. Her hair is pulled up, but pieces hang loose in her face. She has the music on, so she doesn't hear me come in. I walk up behind her, wanting to touch her, but instead I turn the music down. She drops the paper towel she is holding and reels around. You scared the hell out of me. She presses her hand to her chest. I didn't hear you come in. That's kind of obvious. I search her green eyes, crammed with misery. She fidgets with a stack of plates and carries them over to the cupboard before backtracking to the sink. She's wound up over something and too much energy is in her. Her mom was like that a lot of times. But Ella's not her mother, whether she realizes it or not. I collect the plates from her hand and set them in the sink. Do you want to tell me what's got you all worked up? Tapping her fingers on the sides of her legs, she shakes her head. I should have never sent you that text. I don't know why I did it. She starts to turn away from me, but I catch the bottom of her shirt. Ella May, stop talking to me like we're business associates. I know you better than anyone and I know when something's bothering you. I said I was fine. Her voice is tight as she forces back the tears. The girl never lets herself cry, even when her mom died. No, you're not, I steer her by the shoulders toward me. And you need to let it out. She stares at the floor. I can't. I tuck my finger under her chin and raise her head up looking into her eyes. Yes, you can. It's killing you inside. Her shoulders quiver and she lets her head fall against my chest. I rub her back and tell her it will be okay. It's not much, but it's enough for the moment. Finally she pulls back and her face is unreadable. Where's Lila? I left her with Ethan at the shop. I sit down on the kitchen table that's stacked with unopened bills. She's supposed to come back here when her car's fixed. She gazes out the window, lost in her thoughts. She could just go home after Ethan's done. She doesn't need to come back here. Where does she live? In California. Then she probably shouldn't leave tonight. I glance out the window at the sun setting behind the shallow hills. It's late and she's going to be driving by herself, right? 
Ella nods, spaced out as she twists her hair around her finger. And I worry about her making the drive by herself. I mean she practically freaked out when we ran into Grant Ford at the restrooms over by the lake. My fingers grip the edge of the table. You ran into Grant Ford. She lowers her hand from her hair and lets it fall to her side. Yeah, but it wasn't a big deal. He just acted like himself and you know how that is. I release the table from my death grip, trying to clear the anger out of my head. No matter what Ella says, Grant Ford never should have left her on the bridge that night when she was that out of it. I stretch my legs out in front of me and change the direction of the conversation. How did you end up becoming friends with Lila? She bites down on her lip, contemplating. We were roommates. She shrugs, letting her lip pop out from her teeth and it drives me crazy because all I want to do is bite down on it myself. She was really nice and different from all my friends here and I wanted a change. I hop off the table and move in front of her. Change is good, but completely shutting down is a whole other story, Ella, have you? Did you ever talk to anyone about what happened with your mom? Her shoulders stiffen and she turns for the doorway, preparing to leave. That's none of your business. I block her path. Yes it is. I've known you forever, so I get full rights to what's inside your head. Her eyes narrow and she puts her hands on her hips. Get out of my way, Mika Scott. What is it with you using my last name? I say. Before, when you'd get mad at me, you'd just call me a douchebag. I don't use those words anymore, she says flatly. I'm nicer than that. Really? I accuse. Because you sure seem pissed off at me all the time. I'm trying not to be, she fumes. But you're making it very hard for me. Alright, you need a time out. I've had enough of your stubborn crap. I pick her up by the waist and throw her over my shoulder. She lets out a startled gasp and pounds her fists onto my back. Damn it Mika, put me down. Ignoring her, I walk out the back door and down the empty driveway. I think about grabbing her ass just because I can, but I'm afraid she might bite me, although, that doesn't sound bad. Mika, she complains furiously. Put me down. My mom steps out of the house as I carry her toward the garage. She's dressed in a black dress a little too short for her age. Her highlighted hair is fluffed up like a poodle and her makeup is caked on. She must have a date. She stops on the top step and tilts her head to the side to get a better look. Ella, is that you? Ella stops fussing and lifts up her head to look at my mom. Hi, Miss Scott. How are you? Hi, honey, I'm doing good, but is there a reason Mika's carrying you like that? She questions. Are you hurt? Ella shakes her head. No, I'm fine. Mika just thinks he's funny. Which means she secretly likes what I'm doing, but won't admit it. Actually, I'm taking her for a ride, I say slyly, 
inching my hand up the back of Ella's leg, and she slaps the back of my head playfully. I'm taking you for a ride in my car. And you think I'm the pervert? My mom sighs, shaking her head, and opens her purse. Well, it's nice to see you two together again. She takes out her car keys and her heels click as she trots down the steps. Mika sure has missed you while you were gone. By mom, I wave her off, heading for the garage again, as my mom climbs into her Cadillac parked in the street near the curb. Is she going on a date? Ella asks curiously. She's been going on a lot of dates lately. I swing open the car door and set her down in the passenger seat. She tries to climb out. I'm not going anywhere tonight, Mika. I gently push her back into the seat. I'm not going to let you sit around in your room and sulk while your brother's around. Let's go out and have some fun. She pauses, crossing her arms over her chest and her boobs nearly pop out of her top. But I need to be there when Lila comes back. I can't just let her come back to Dean and my dad passed out on the couch. I'll take care of it. I rip my gaze from her tits, take out my cell phone, and text Ethan. Me taking Ella up to the back road. Wanna get Lila and meet us up there? Ella slumps back into the seat. What are you up to? I hold up my finger. Just a sec. Ethan, yeah, sounds cool. Me, is Lila up for it? And make sure you ask her. Don't just assume. Ethan, she said she's good, but is Ella okay with going up there? Me, we'll see when we get up there. Ethan, dude, she's gonna kick your ass. Me, see you there. I stuff my phone into the back pocket of my jeans and close her door before climbing into the driver's seat. Where are you taking me? she asks, trying to appear annoyed but her inquisitiveness seeps through her eyes. It's a surprise. Once the garage door is open, I peel down the driveway. And Lila and Ethan are going to meet us there. A surprise, ha, huh? she mulls it over. I'm not a fan of surprises. My lips spread to a grin. You're such a liar. She stays silent and I know I've won this one, which is rare, but I'll take it. With a swift crank of the steering wheel, I align the car onto the road and spin the tires off into the night happy because I managed to chip away a tiny piece of that armor she's wearing. Ella I realize I have more issues than I thought. As soon as we turn onto the back road, a passion combusts inside me. It only flames hotter when we pull up to the hitch, an old abandoned restaurant stationed at the end of the road. It's the perfect setup for street racing, with a long straight road tucked between the lofty trees on the mountains. The sky is black, the moon bright, but there are clouds rolling in. I cringe, thinking of the night on the bridge. We'd been racing before I'd gone there. Mika gets a text message right as we brink the end of the road. He pulls the car to the side, maneuvering carefully across the potholes. He pushes the parking brake in and checks his phone, shutting it off, and looking torn up. 
What's wrong? I ask. You look upset. Nothing's wrong. Everything's great. He's lying, but how can I press him to tell the truth when I'm a liar too? So this is your surprise? I want my voice to sound disappointed, but it comes out pleased. Mika gives me a sidelong glance. Don't smile, pretty girl. It'll ruin your whole I am neutral and don't give a shit act. I opt to remain impartial. Who are you planning to race tonight? You mean who are we racing? He smiles alluringly through the dark cab of the car. Well, I thought I'd leave that up to you. In front of the trees is a line of cars with their headlights on and their owners standing near the front. They are a rough crowd, mostly guys except for Shalia, a big girl with arms thicker than my legs. She's the only girl I've ever truly feared. Well, there's Mikey. I rub my forehead with the back of my hand. Does he still got that piece of crap six-cylinder in his Camaro? Yeah, he does. Mika leans back in the seat, examining me amusedly through the dark. You think that's who I should go for? It's the obvious choice. I don't like where my thoughts are heading, but I can't shut off my basic instinct. I've always been a hanging out with the guys kind of girl and therefore there is an abundance of knowledge about cars stashed away in my head. Lila is the first girl I've been friends with. Although, what kind of a win would it be when you have this car that can clearly take on much more? You think I should take on someone in my own league? If you want the win to mean anything, then yeah. We look at each other, like magnets begging to get closer. Yet flip one the wrong direction and they will push apart. So which one is it, pretty girl? He drapes an arm over the headrest behind me and his fingers brush my shoulder. The underdog or the big dog? There's a dare in the air, teasing the real me to come out tonight. I want to give in, just for a few hours, and let my inner ropes untie. I want to allow myself to breathe again, but I fear the loss of control, I fear I'll have to feel everything, including my guilt. Mika, I think we should go back. I put my seatbelt back on. This isn't my thing anymore. He presses his lips together firmly. Please can we have a night? Just you and I. I really need this right now. I pick up on his strange vibe and the sorrow in his eyes. Okay, what's wrong? You've seemed a little out of it. Was it bad news on that text you got? He traces the figure eight tattoo on his forearm. Do you remember when I got this? I absent-mindedly touch my lower back. How could I forget, since I have the same one on my back? Do you remember why we got them? I can't remember anything about that night. Exactly. Yet you'll remember it forever. No matter what happens, which is completely ironic. He lets his finger linger on the tattoo that represents eternity. There's something bugging you. I tug the bottom of my shirt down to cover up my tattoo. Do you want to talk about it? He shakes his head still focused on the tattoo. Nah, 
I'm good. To distract him from his thoughts, I point my finger at a smoking hot 1970 Pontiac GTO, blue with white racing stripes. What about Benny? Does he still have the 455? Mika's eyes are pools of black liquid. You think we should take on the big dog? I think you should take on the big dog, I clarify. I'll just watch you kick his ass. His expression darkens. No way. I'm not racing unless you're in the car with me. It's tradition. A starvation inside me emerges. All right, I'll ride with you, just as long as you do one thing for me. Say it and it's yours, he says without blinking. My hunger urges me closer to him. I prop my elbows on the console, and my arms are trembling. He doesn't move frozen like a statue as I put my lips next to his ear. Make sure you win, I breathe and my body arches into him on its own accord, before I sit back in the seat. His face is indecipherable, his breathing fierce, his gaze relentless. Okay, then. Let's go win us a race. We climb out of the car and hike across the dirt road toward the row of cars and their owners. I shield my eyes from the headlights and wrap an arm around myself, knowing these guys are going to give me crap for how I'm dressed. Mika swings his arm around me protectively. Relax. I got you, baby. Well, what do we have here? Mikey, the owner of the Camaro, strides up to us. He's got black hair, a kink in his nose, and his thick neck is enclosed with a barbed wire tattoo. Is the infamous duo back again to get their asses kicked? I roll my eyes. You beat us once and that was by default due to a flat tire. His face pinches as he takes in my shirt, tank top, and curled hair. What the fuck happened to you? Chandra, his girlfriend, sputters a laugh. Her dress is so tight that her curves bulge out of it and her stilettos make her almost the same height as me. Holy shit, she like turned into a little princess or something. Mika squeezes my shoulder, trying to keep me calm. So who's up first? Or has no one decided yet? Mikey eyes Mika's Chevelle and there's a nervous look in his eyes. You think you can just walk in here and play the game after sitting out for nearly a year? I mouth to Mika, a year? Mika shrugs. What? You were gone. Why the hell would I want to race? Again, you need to move on without. I trail off. Mikey will use what I say against Mika, so I have to watch my mouth. We want to race Benny. Mikey's laughter echoes the night. You and what army? I point at Mika's Chevelle parked near the road. That army right there. Mikey shakes his head and shoes us away. That thing don't stand a chance against the GTO. Now run along and come back when you got something bigger. He's testing my control. A lot. As opposed to yours. I retort, getting into Mikey's face. Because that thing's all looks and no go. 
Mika directs me back by the shoulders and a trace of amusement laces his voice. Easy there, tiger. Let's try not to get our asses kicked tonight, okay? Benny hops off the hood of his car, flicks his cigarette to the ground, and leaves his buddies to join us. What's up? Did I hear someone wanted to race me? Benny's the kind of guy that everyone respects because they're afraid of him. When he was a freshman he got into a fight at school with a senior twice his size and beat him up pretty badly. No one knows what the fight was over or what happened, but it was enough that everyone became cautious of Benny. Mikey points a finger sharply at me. Princess right here wants to challenge you to a race in that thing. Benny's eyes wander to the Chevelle as he cocks his shaven head and crosses his muscular arms. Mika, isn't that your car? Mika pats my back and winks at me. Yeah, apparently she's my spokesperson. Benny deliberates this and then turns to Mikey, who's glaring at me. I don't see what the big deal is. I have no problem with Mika racing. In fact, it might be kinda nice to have a challenge for a change. Benny slaps Mikey on the back kind of hard and then pounds fists with Mika. Thanks man, Mika says with a respective nod. Are you and I going to line up first then? Benny bobs his head up and down nodding as he stares at the road pensively. Yeah man, I think that'd work. They chat a little bit more about the rules and what not, while Mikey continues to scowl at me like an angry dog. Once they're done talking, Mika and I walk back to the car, while everyone else scatters toward the starting line located right in front of the hitch. So what's your plan? I ask. Because beating him won't be easy. You're my plan. He opens the passenger door for me. With you in the car, there's no way I won't win, otherwise you'll never let me live it down. Tucking my head into the car, I drop into the seat and then look up at him. I won't make your car go any faster. He grins, slamming the door. Sure you will. He slides across the front of the hood and climbs into the driver's seat. You're such a show-off, I remark. He starts up the engine and it thunders to life. That's like the pot calling the kettle black. I slump back in the seat and fold my arms. I may have been a lot of things, but I was never a show-off. He hecks a finger under my chin and angles my head toward him. Taylor Krepner's graduation party two years ago. You were standing on the roof with a snowboard strapped to your feet, telling everyone you could make the jump. I think that's pretty close to showing off. I make an innocent face. But I did make the jump, didn't I? Yeah, but not without breaking your arm, he says. And that's beside the point. You're right, I admit, touching the small scar on my arm where the bone broke through the skin. I was showing off and you had to drive my dumbass to the hospital, then sit in the waiting room while I had surgery to put my arm back together. His finger traces a line down my neck and to my chest bone. I was there because I wanted to be. You missed a performance because of me. I don't care, never have. My gaze involuntarily flicks to his lips. 
Suddenly, I want to kiss him, like I did that night on the bridge. It makes me uncomfortable because the feeling owns me. I lean away, putting space between us. Sensing my transfer of attitude, he revs up the engine and spins the tires, fishtailing the car to the start-up line. He shoots me a smug look, cocking an eyebrow. Now that's showing off. Shaking my head, I restrain a grin. Then he lines up the front of his GTO with Mika's Chevelle and his girlfriend struts up between the two cars. She's wearing jeans and a short t-shirt that shows her stomach. She flips her dark hair off her shoulder and then raises her hands above her head. People line up along the road, watching, and placing bets on the winner. I spot Ethan and Lila toward the front, chatting about something, and Lila is doing her flirty hair flip thing. When did they get here? Mika ignores me, eyeing Benny through his rolled down window. To the baseline and back. Benny's arm is resting casually on top of the steering wheel. Yeah, man. First one back wins. They look away from each other. Benny waves at his girlfriend and she nods her head. On your mark. Get set. Go. Her hands shoot down and screeches cut the air. A trail of dust engulfs us as we race off. The trees on the side of the road are a blur and the sky is one big streak of stars. I keep silent as Mika shifts the car over and over again, but something inside me awakens from a very deep sleep. Benny pulls ahead and makes a sharp swerve right in front of us. His red tail lights are blinding in the night and his exhaust is puffing out thin clouds of smoke. Mika speeds up inching the front end toward the rear of the GTO. As we approach the end, Benny pulls farther ahead, but it's not over yet. Mika has a thing for flipping the car around, without decreasing the acceleration. It's scary as hell, but it works every time. Besides with the longer body of Benny's GTO it doesn't have quite the turning power. We reach the end and I should probably be nervous. The road cuts off into a steep, rocky hill and the space to turn around is narrow, but I've never gotten scared, not even now. I guess I can't change what's in my blood. The GTO begins to slant sideways as Benny turns it. Mika veers to the side to get around him and shoots for the open gap between the car and the trees. I grab the handle above my head, the brakes squeal, and I brace my feet up on the dashboard. It's like being on a merry-go-round on crack. Everything spins, the trees, the sky, Mika. For a second, I shut my eyes and it feels like I'm flying. It takes me back to the night on the bridge. She said she could fly. The car straightens out and Mika floors the gas pedal. Like I predicted, Benny is having a harder time lining back up. By the time we're speeding up the road again, he's a small distance behind us. Mika punches the gas and shifts the car into a higher gear. The long front end of the GTO materializes through my window and Mika floors it, shooting me a look that lets me know I can tell him to slow down if I want. I don't. People flee to the side, panicking at our dangerous speed as we rip through the finish line.
It isn't clear who the winner is or who's going to be able to get their car to stop in time, before crushing into the hitch. Brakes shriek and dust swamps the windows. My body is thrown forward with the car's abrupt halt and I smack my head on the dashboard. Mika works to regain control of the wheel and straightens the car as it skids to a stop. Everything settles and the dust slowly clears. Mika and I stare out the windshield, breathing loudly, our eyes as wide as golf balls. The front bumper of the Chevelle is a sliver away from a very large tree. Holy shit, Mika whispers and looks at me, his eyes bulging. Are you okay? I lower my hand from the dashboard, my chest heaving with my breaths. Rubbing the bump on my head, I turn in my seat toward Mika. There is an eerie calm inside me and one of my worst fears becomes a reality. I'm an adrenaline junkie. Plain and simple, but I think it's how I've been all along. I just never admitted. I'm no longer in control. As I incline toward Mika, my heart flutters to life in my chest. My eyes shut and my lips brush his, gently tasting him. It feeds my hunger vaguely and I edge back, letting my eyes open. Mika is looking at me, his eyes pools of blue like the deep spots of the ocean hidden from the world. His hand comes up behind my head and he entices my lips back to his. Something snaps inside me, like a rubber band. With one swift movement, and the aid of my own willingness, Mika lifts me over the console and I straddle his lap, looping my arms around his neck. His hands burrow into my thighs and slip under my skirt onto my bare skin. My breath falters at the intimacy of his touch. No one has ever touched me like this before, without me running away. Usually, being this close to someone sends me into a room packed with self-doubt, panic, distrust, and unfamiliarity. My legs tense and Mika leans back. Stay here, baby, he whispers, like he can read my thoughts. Trust me, okay. Don't run. He waits for me to nod and then crashes his lips into mine, keeping his hands under my skirt. I arch my body into him, pressing my chest against his, and my nipples tingle. His tongue sensually plays with mine, tracing every spot on my mouth and my lips. My body starts to fill with a secret longing. Mika moves his mouth away from mine and my legs tremble in objection. He sucks a path of kisses down my jawline, moving to my neck and residing on my chest right above where my breast curves out of the top of my shirt. It sends a shock through my body and my legs uncontrollably tighten around him my knees pressing into his sides. He lets out a slow, deep groan and his hand slides higher into my skirt as he guides me closer. I can feel him pressing in between my legs and it scares the shit out of me, but not enough to make me stop. It's like all the sexual tension I ran away from has sprung free all at once. My fingers sneak under the bottom of his shirt and trace along the outline of his lean muscles. I don't know where to stop or how to put the line back up. My mind is racing and I clutch onto his shoulders needing my control back. Someone bangs on the window. Are you two having fun in there? I jump back and my cheeks start to heat at the sight of Ethan and Lila staring at us through the window. 
In his black tee and jeans, Ethan blends in with the night, but his dark, insinuating smile glows. Lila's eyes are magnified and her jaw is hanging open. Mika does nothing to help the situation. A lazy grin spreads across his face as he watches me through hooded eyes, looking very pleased with himself. The adrenaline washes out of me and leaves a numb feeling in its place. I climb off his lap and straighten my skirt and hair before getting out of the car. I calmly walk around the back of the car and join Ethan and Lila. So who won the race? I ask, smoothing the last of the wrinkles out of my skirt. Ethan smacks at me. Is that what you're really thinking about at the moment? I stare at him blankly. What else would I be thinking about? Mika climbs out of the car, stretching his long legs. We won, I'm pretty sure, he says, taking my hand like it's the most natural thing in the world. Although, I'm betting there's an argument going on about it. Ethan nods agreeably and takes a sip of his soda. Yep, everyone who bet on you is insisting you've won and vice versa with Benny. Mika interlaces our fingers. So the same old, same old. You know how these things go. Ethan pats Mika's shoulder sympathetically. They're never going to come to a decision. My hand is sweating in Mika's. He just cracked me open and my mind is racing with a billion thoughts. I can't do this with him. I can't crush him. I need to repaint the line somehow. We should just leave, Mika says to me. Let's not even give them the benefit of our argument. You want to drive out of here all suave? I ask. And make a grand exit. Mika smiles and squeezes my hand. A grand statement. Which would be? That we don't give a shit. I let out a shaky breath and nod. That sounds good to me. You want to meet up at the house, he asks Ethan. I'm sure we're going to have to do some tuning up on the beast after what I just did. Lila scrunches her nose and pops her gum. The beast? Do I even want to know what that is? Mika taps the car door with his free hand. Yep, that's what I named it. Kind of like how you call your car your baby. Lila laughs. Oh, I get it. Although, I like my name better. Mika traces his thumb along the palm of my hand. Are you ready to go? Or do you want to go pick a fight with someone first? I flash a panicked glance at Lila, who knits her eyebrows. Maybe Lila and I should ride together. I haven't spent any time with her today. You've spent time with me every day for the last eight months, she replies. I think we're good for a few hours. I'll take care of her. Ethan chucks the empty bottle of soda across the parking lot and it lands in the back of his truck. Really, really good care of her. Lila lets her blonde hair fall into her face to hide her blush. I've never seen her blush like that. What exactly have the two of them been up to tonight? Mika shakes his head at Ethan. Be good.
Ethan rolls his eyes and then walks off with Lila toward his truck. Mika and I get into his car and I prepare myself to make a speech. Mika squeezes his eyes shut and holds his hand up. Don't even say it. Just let it go for the night. Please. I need to just feel this. The pain in his voice causes me to fasten my jaw shut. Opening his eyes, he starts up the car and we drive down the road. Mika waves to Benny as we pass and everyone's eyes follow us. Then the darkness takes over as we pull out onto the main road and the headlights light up the night like a tunnel that leads to the unknown.